Hello, everybody, and welcome to this Plus Acumen Learning Lab on Leading Consequential Change Through Adaptive Leadership. Uh, welcome. If you can hear me, let me know in the chat. Uh, today, I'll introduce these gentlemen in, in more detail. You, you can see them at the bottom of the screen right now. But we have the pleasure of welcoming Eric Martin, who is the managing partner of Adaptive Change Advisors. And we also have a very special guest today, one of our Acumen Fellows, Bimal Kumar, who will be joining Eric today and sharing more of his experience and uh, discussion about adaptive leadership. My name is Danielle Sutton, and I'm the content animator for Plus Acumen. If you aren't familiar with Plus Acumen, we are the school, the world's school for social change, and we offer over 30 free and low cost courses that have been taken by over 450,000 change makers around the world. And these include several courses to help you grow your social enterprise and develop as a leader. And today's learning lab is especially um, connected to our courses because our course on adaptive leadership was created in partnership with Eric. Nearly uh, 30,000 people have registered and gone through the course over the last six years. And now this is the first time we're doing a shorter kind of uh, preview or highlights or um, starter version of it with Eric. So really excited. Um, Eric is, as I said, with Adaptive Change Advisors, and he specializes in leadership development and systems change, where his work draws upon this adaptive leadership framework, which was developed at Harvard. And Eric will talk more about it, about how he uh, got into this work, but it's all about democratizing leadership and putting tools that drive change into the hands of anyone to create change. And you've helped uh, a lot of people with that, including working with the Acumen Fellows in a lot more depth, which is how you guys were first connected. So we're gonna hear more about that story. And Bimal is founder of Movement for Scavenger Community, an organization committed to the eradication of manual scavenging in India and bringing education and awareness to the scavenger community. So we're going to learn more about that as well. Uh, and like I said, you'll get a taste of the types of sessions that Eric runs on adaptive leadership, not only through our course, but also directly with fellows like Bimmel. So we're really excited to have you guys here. Um, we've scheduled 90 minutes today, and we, because we don't want to rush through the material, we might finish a little bit sooner, but we just want to make sure you guys have that time blocked in your calendar. Um, so please go ahead and introduce yourself in the comments, share your name and where you're from. I see a lot of people introducing themselves already, which is wonderful. And near the end, we will have time for questions. So please keep your questions coming into the chat and I'll watch out for them to ask both Fimmel and Eric um, in the presentation. And then you will also have a replay coming out by email. So if you need to um, access the information again, don't worry, you'll have that available right afterwards. So without further ado, I will turn the floor over and let these gentlemen kick off the, the learning lab. Well, thank you, Danielle. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, Excellent. we can. Wow, a learning lab. I love the name of this this series, Danielle. You know, uh, uh, laboratories for me bring back uh, pretty fond memories. In fact, if you can put on the um, the slide deck here, I was uh, I was a pre med and engineering major in college, and uh, you know when I think about laboratories, I think about this guy Sir Isaac Newton. You can see in the upper left, but um, you know, some of you might know this Newtonian worldview is already a hundred years outdated. You know, this idea that the only way to make something happen is to apply a force to it. I, I chose these pictures here. You can see the consequence of applying force. You know, that force-based mentality to making change happen, I think, has created a lot of the challenges that we face in this world. Uh, from climate change to inequity to the kinds of issues that Vimble is going to talk about. So, um, you know, I, I want to invite us in this conversation for the next 75, 90 minutes to entertain a different way of creating change in the world, one that doesn't rely on planning, one that doesn't rely on just another force based approach, be it a, a mental, psychological force or forcing people to do something they don't want to do with money. 
uh, using money, you know, physical force. These are the kinds of ways that people tend to make change in the world. And let's be honest, you know, we're not going to outforce the other forces in the world, like the militaries and the politicians and the big businesses. We just won't do it. So if we want to get extraordinary outcomes, we need to find another power that doesn't depend on force planning and control. So as we dive into this conversation, uh, there's going to be a lot of opportunity, I hope, for you to reflect on a challenge that you face. Uh, you know, maybe it's a project that you're working on. Maybe it's a courageous conversation that you need to have with somebody. Maybe it's getting a piece of legislation passed in your local politics. Uh, maybe it's at home. You know, maybe you're trying to convince your mother or your father just to let you be, to let you marry whomever you want to marry. Um, maybe you're trying to force yourself or force somebody to do something, to improve, to be better. And, and I want to just kind of put it out there as we start into this conversation uh, that most efforts at self-improvement, I think, are actually a form of self-aggression. You know, if only I was better, if only I was smarter, more attractive, if only I was a more effective leader. So I want you to, in the back of your mind for this conversation, think of something that you're trying to change. And let's try to find a different way to go about that change that may not be the usual leadership that you're used to. So uh, let's, let's move on here. I'm not gonna, this is not gonna be a slide-based presentation, but I just wanna give you some visuals as we go through because I know some people are visual learners and so I wanna make sure that you have something in front of you. Uh, we're here to talk today, as Danielle said, about adaptive leadership. And in a nutshell, adaptive leadership is about mobilizing people you know, with or without formal authority. It's about mobilizing people to tackle challenges that have no known or easy answers. So I'm gonna offer that definition for you. And I, I'm not gonna lecture you about leadership because, well, let's be honest, that would be the old stuff, wouldn't it? Even though that's the easiest thing to do, it's a trap. So let's not fall into that here. You know, there's a perfect storm, me having this platform, me having some expertise, me not knowing much about you, your expertise, your passions, your stories, and yet knowing that we have some important work to do together today. So that's my contribution to this mess, this perfect storm, but you're contributing to it too. You know, maybe you desperately want my knowledge, so desperately that in fact, you're willing to check your intellect at the door and act more dumb than you actually are in exchange for cheap answers and checklists and how-tos. Or you know, maybe you're skeptical about me, skeptical about leadership, wondering what what do you have to learn that you don't already know? You know, or maybe we're just all distracted right now, multitasking, pulled in many directions, and we're going to have to fight to keep each, other, each other's attention to do some important work. So that's kind of the challenge of leadership, isn't it? Grabbing and holding people's attention to the work is actually about 50% of the leadership work. So what we're doing on this call in some ways bears some some resemblance to the challenge you and I and Vimbo and others face to mobilize people to focus on something that maybe they don't want to, or maybe they don't know how to. So the, the people in these, uh, in these photos here uh, will probably come into clearer context as we get into this conversation. Uh, one of the folks in these photos here you might recognize is my very good friend and colleague and co-conspirator Vimal Kumar. Uh, Vimal, welcome to this call. So glad you can make it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Eric and Janela, for this great, great opportunity to share my experience and learn from all of you here and also sharing about my work. Uh, so, yeah, I'm Vimal uh, from India, uh, the state called Haryana and a city called Kurukshetra. So I'm working for the movement for scavenger community. It's initiated uh, by me in 2009. And uh, you can see in the photo, the very first photo with the people here, it's my old house and which I converted into a community resource center. So this is the ham hamlet of uh, the sweeper community there. But now it's a study center. It's a community resource center there. And next photo, uh, you can see the Eric and my father here. Yeah. They're exchanging gift, or there is like a. It's not like a gift. It's just, it's like a story. You know, they are exchanging stories to each other. Uh, so Eric and I know better about this thing. 
And the third picture about me is, uh, is in Barakpur. I'm, I'm mobilizing people on bicycle in a different city like Kolkata. Yeah, yeah. so this is a small introduction about me. Yeah. And much more later on in, in, the, in the call too. So thanks, Vimal. Uh, for that. I, I didn't get your permission to post that video or that photo of you, so I hope you don't mind. I, I just love that photo. You'll see why later on in this in this conversation, why I love it so much. Um, so the three parts of this call, just very quickly, is we're going to have part one to get engaged, to really start applying these ideas right away. Uh, part two is going to be a dialogue with Vimal. Yeah, we'll have a chance to look at leadership and what it means to lead consequential change under really tough conditions. And then part three is going to be about you. And I'm going to ask you to, um, to, to really reflect deeply on what a change is that you might need to make in your own work, in your own life, in order to create more impact. So let's move on. Uh, this first idea, part one, is this notion that we in adapt a leadership call getting on the balcony. And getting on the balcony is a metaphor for getting reflection in the midst of action. So before I explain this to you in detail, I wanna try something right now. So for all 202 people on this call and growing, I want you to, assuming that you're sitting down, to put your hands onto your chair and grab the bottom of your chair. Bimbo, you can do this too. I don't think you knew this was coming. Grab that bottom of your chair, okay? Now I want you to pull yourself down into that chair. Pull as hard as you can. Like you're gonna fall up to the sky if you don't pull down harder. Pull harder, even harder. Give it all your strength, but don't break that chair. Keep pulling, give it all your might. All right, three more seconds. Three, two, one. All right, release. Whew, that's a workout. Notice the feeling in your body. Notice the relaxation in your shoulders. That's a physical experience of what it would feel like to be on the balcony. Because what we do oftentimes when we're not on the balcony, we're on the dance floor. You know, we're doing that day-to-day -day work. We're exerting a mental energy, a mental force. We're trying so hard to figure stuff out. And in that state, we really lose the big picture. So getting on the balcony is a practice. It's one of the most important leadership practices of getting reflection in the midst of action. And this happens, you know, not just in leadership, it happens in life. If you've ever played sports before, if you're an athlete, you know what it feels like, I think, if you're good, to see the field, you know, to see all the players, to see the game while you're in the middle of playing it. That's an example of being on the balcony and being on the dance floor at the same time. I have friends in the military who tell me it's a very similar concept when you're in the heat of war, being able to rise above the battlefield and see what's happening so you can make the right decision. So getting on the balcony is a very important skill set to keep us being strategic, to see systemically, to see the patterns of behavior, and even to see ourselves, frankly, in some of the steps that we're making. Uh, I wanna do another, just a, a very quick getting on the balcony example here. Again, trying to get you to feel it because adaptive leadership is about feeling, it's about what's happening below your neck. So this next slide here, uh, if I can go through, there we go. So yeah, this is getting on the balcony, this idea of getting reflection in the midst of action, as I said, uh, is really about trying to notice the leadership moments in front of us. And this next slide here is going to be a mental activity to, again, give you a sense of what it feels like to be on the balcony. So have a look at this uh, and tell me what you see. Now, if you if you know what the answer is right now, uh, don't, don't chat it just yet. Just give everyone else a second to catch up with you. I'll give you about five seconds. What do you see in this picture? Okay, so if anyone has the answer there, 208 people on the call, chat it and see who got the, who got the right answer. Person? Okay, yeah, you might think it's a reclining person. Anyone else? It's tough, right? Let me give you a hint. Uh, ah, Richard. Way to go, Richard. That's a cow, guys. Ah, yeah. Now, let me let me show you what this looks like. Here, do you see the cow yet? A density map. There we go. Yeah. 
So that that's a cow. If you can look there, and, and I, I show this because in this moment, if you see the cow, you'll have a mental clarity. You'll say, oh my gosh, there it is. I can't believe I didn't see that before. Your mind will feel relaxed. You're not straining to understand anymore. Yeah, Rick, yeah, cow. Uh, you know, that's this feeling of being on the balcony. So I give you a physical, ex a physical experience as well as a mental. And just notice throughout your life and in your work, when you're facing tough challenges, when you're trying to mobilize people, are you on the dance floor where all that energy is being exerted? Or are you on the balcony where you're getting some clarity, seeing the patterns, seeing yourself? So this learning lab is an example, actually, of getting on the balcony. It's an opportunity for each of us, all of you, me too, to get some perspective on our work, get them some perspective on our leadership opportunity, the leadership moments in front of us, and get some perspective on ourselves. So I want to invite you. I know it's busy. We're probably some of you are probably you know multitasking. Put the multitasking down if you can, because I do think this next 70 minutes or so can be one of the more important conversations that you're in for the rest of the day. And what drives me here at Adaptive Change is this mission to democratize leadership, to put tools, leadership tools that drive change into the hands of anyone, anyone who's driving outcomes. And really in doing so, trying to change the world in a small way, you know, changing our relationship to leadership is when we do that, one way we do that. I grew up in the city of Detroit in the United States. And the city of Detroit, you know, during the decline was really a tough place to live. And I always wondered, why doesn't somebody do something about this? We could see the, the decay in our neighborhoods every single summer. It would get worse and worse. And I grew up feeling helpless until so I realized someday that actually I didn't need to wait for a mayor or a president or even a mother or father. And so for me and for I hope for each one of you here, there's a leadership opportunity in your life, in your work. Uh, in your community to change things for the better. And that's what we're really here to do. So I wanna, I wanna just do a kind of a quick poll here because one of the first ideas of leadership, oh, by the way, this is Albert Einstein, yeah. So there would, a, a, a call like this would not be replete, re, re, complete without an Albert Einstein quote. He said, if I only had one hour to save the world, I would spend 55 minutes defining the problem and five minutes finding the solution. Now that's actually the most famous quote that. Albert Einstein never actually said, <laughs> but it's attributed to him. And, you know, I, I like it. So I put it up here as well. Um, so that's an example. And again, this is the mission for me to democratize leadership. The idea that uh, everyone leads every day, that we need access to leadership resources like this learning lab, that change is normal, and that it's the people that matter most. And I think Vimal will really help us sink into that idea. Thank you, Luis, for your comment there. Um, so. With leadership work, the first concept in adaptive leadership uh, is this question really of whose work is it? Whose work is it? And then, and only then, can we begin to ask, what is our work? And what are we gonna do? What's the project? And so often we start in reverse. We start with what's the project? What's the change I wanna make? And then who do I need to get involved? And so we need to flip that equation. It's about who are my people? What's our work? And so what I wanna do now and Danielle's gonna help in the, in the poll of this, is just find out who are, who are our people on this call? So we're gonna spend just a minute or two surveying you. Where are you from, what do you do? So Danielle, if you could just put poll question number one up, um, I'll show them here on the screen too. And everyone just please chime in so we can see who all is on this call because I, I'm reluctant to jump in until I know a little bit more about you than I do. So Danielle, can we put the first poll of where's home for people? Yep, we have it running and we it's still moving a little bit, but we have about 58% North America. Can you see it? I can see it. Okay, sounds good. Great. Is this gonna run for a few seconds on its own or do we need yep, to Yep, we can stop at any time. Looks like it's pretty much there. Yeah. So maybe I'll end it now. We can okay. go to the next one. All right, poll number two is what do you do? Um, and this is going to be an open chat. So you know, what's your job, your job title, or if you don't have a job, or if your job is not the main thing you do in your life, it's not the most important thing to you, just tell us how do you spend your time? You know, what, are you, what are you putting your energy, life's energy into? So poll number two is just what do you, what do, you do, your job or how you spend your time? And is that going to be in the chat box, Danielle? Yeah, it'll come through in the chat, and there's a slight delay, but we'll see things coming through. I see project manager. Uh, freelance tr strategic planner. 
activist, PhD researcher, management consultant, Excellent. leadership coach, partnerships yeah. manager, people. industrial design, lots coming in. This is great. Excellent. So keep them coming. We'll, we'll keep looking. Let's go to poll number three now. This is back in the polling area. Um, and the question here is, how familiar are you with adaptive leadership? Again, if I'm going to do some work with you, I need to get a sense of, you know, maybe some of you have done this before. You've studied this. So the options here are formally trained. You've read a few articles, never heard of it, and then other. This is great. I love this polling technology, they know. I, I yeah, it's like fun to see them hover. I sound like an old guy that I know. <laughs> All right, good. That's really helpful. Uh, so, and then poll number four is why are you interested in adaptive leadership? You know, I personally, I don't care about leadership. I care about leadership for what? What do we, what do we want leadership for? So the question here, why, why are you interested in leadership? Is it for your own development? Is it for your team? Is it to tackle a real world challenge or is it something else? That's a nice balance. I like that. Okay. And then lastly, you know, how ready are you to change yourself? because that's really a big part of leadership is being open to the possibility that you yourself are contributing to the very problem you face. You know, that you're the, you're the dog that's nipping at your own tail. <laughs> I'm ready to bring it on. It depends on the day, okay? A little bit of honesty coming in, I like that. I don't need to change. All right, that's great. Okay, guys, so that's it. That's, who, that's who's on the call. Um, let's, let's dive into the kind of the, the meat of this idea of who are my people? And we, we think of this as a stakeholder analysis activity. Uh, there's a, a whole model and resources, which I'll share later on, around how you do stakeholder analysis. But I really wanted to boil it down here to the, the main ideas, you know, the, the very key ideas of adaptive leadership. And it's this idea of in leading change, consequential change, there are six key relationships or six key stakeholder groups. We actually call them factions and I can say why later on. But these, these key relationships are ones we need to pay attention to as we move forward on change. The very first relationship or stakeholder group is what we call the opposition. Now the tendency is to cast the opposition as the bad guys, you know, the, the bad people. And what I wanna suggest to you here and, and I deeply believe this, that there is no good or bad person. Now, I know we can name a lot of people uh, in our lives, in our politics, perhaps, where we say, oh, that's a bad person, Eric, let me tell you. But let me tell you back that, at least in my experience, talking to many of these bad guys and others, that nobody thinks they're a bad guy, right? No one thinks they're a bad person when they go to bed at night. I have yet to meet a person that goes to bed at night saying, wow, I did a great job today spreading evil in the world. No, they, they tend to say I did a great job at something else that lets them sleep well at night. So these opposition actually deserve some empathy. Now, I'm not saying you have to agree with them. I'm not saying you have to support them because people are doing bad things in the world, hurtful things. But the point here is to stay close, stay close to your opposition because they are actually dealing with some kind of loss. They're actually being asked to give up something. That's why they oppose actually, right? So. And we'll say more about this later on, the resistance that you get from the opposition, the resistance you get from people to change has nothing to do with the change per se. It actually has to do with loss. And we'll go through a list later on, and I'll ask you later on to think about your own aversion to loss, because that may be how you're opposing yourself. The second key relationship here is what we call partners. And some people call them allies, but I want to make a distinction here because the partners are the ones that will take a risk with you. These are ones who will put resources in. They're the ones that will put their political reputation at risk, political capital. Allies, they want you to be successful. They just won't take a risk with you. And so it's very important to differentiate your partners from your allies. Partners are actually very rare, even though we always talk about partnership, partnership, partnership. In fact, I think partnership is something we don't see very often, but we want to create more of. Um, Rick, thanks again for your comment about feeling safe. We can come back to that later on. The third key relationship here when you're leading change is troublemakers. Who are the troublemakers? Who are the people that are sounding the alarm bell? You know, these are the people that are saying, that are saying the world is falling in, or if we don't focus on this, you know, something terrible is going to happen. 
And troublemakers can be annoying, actually, because they always say the same thing. You know when they walk into the room what they're going to say. But the important thing is to protect them because often they have the courage to say things that people don't have the courage to say, right? And so maybe some of you are troublemakers. I don't know. I know I've found myself in that place many times, but we don't want to marginalize them because we need their voice. Fourthly are people we call casualties. And this is an intentionally provocative term. But the idea is that casual, you know, in this change process, some people just can't make the journey, right? They just, they don't have, you don't have the time to bring them along. Uh, and while I believe everyone can change, and I've seen transformational examples in my own life of people doing that, uh, in an organizational context, or even in a movement sometimes, we can't bring everybody along. So the important thing here is to treat them well, take care of them, because people are watching how you treat the casualties, how you treat people who can't make the change. And if you don't treat them well, well, good luck getting people to sign up for your next change initiative. Uh, the fifth key relationship here are the authorities. And these are the people we typically call leaders. And I, I intentionally do not use that name. These are people that are responsible for maintaining the status quo. And so the important thing with authorities is to watch them for signals. Because the minute you begin to change something important, they're going to come down hard on you or they're going to begin to get agitated. So it's important, as always, to stay close to people who have that power. But particularly when leading adaptive change, you want to stay close to them. And then lastly, it's yourself. So one of the mistakes we make is that we think of ourselves not as a stakeholder, but as a person who's kind of in the middle of this change process. And then when people resist it and want to kill the change process, they just kill us. They take us out. And so we need to look at ourselves as just one of these relationships around the table, as you see in the chart over here. So I want you to just think about for as a reflection here, you know, what, what is the stakeholder group or what is the relationship that you tend to get stuck in? You know, what if you think about big change you've been a part of, what is the role that you tend to play? You know, maybe that project or that initiative I asked you to think about earlier, to, earlier in this call, what are you playing in that one? And just make a note of that. Uh, Vimal, you know, I, I, I'm guessing you found yourself in pretty much all of these roles at some point. <laughs> in, during your career and your movement, no? Wh which one do you think you tend to play the most? Vimo, we can't hear you. Uh, hello, Eric. Yeah. yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, your voice was breaking. I could, I could not hear you properly. Uh, can you please repeat? I was just saying, I was saying, which one of these six key roles or relationships do you, you tend to find yourself playing in the work that you do? Yeah, actually, it's about, uh, you can say it's yourself, it's about me. You can see the six, uh, the yourself or, or myself. So uh, definitely in my in my leadership uh, work, I change myself uh, rather than, you know, changing people, people's life or changing people's. So there, there is a lot of changes in myself and uh, this is helpful for my work also. Yeah. Yeah. So I I found myself in the six. Yeah, yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, very honest of you to say, um, and I appreciate that, Bimal. I um, really admired that process that you've been on, and it's really helped me with my own leadership as well, as we'll talk more about in a second. Um, so um, again, for people on the call, I just want you to think about what role do you play, and notice what kind of energy are you putting into that role? You know, is it this? convincing energy? Is it a force-based Newtonian energy where you're exerting a strong physical force or mental force, or you're trying to force people to do something they would not want to do by giving them money, right? That tends to be, by the way, the way we, the most common way we force people to do something they wouldn't do otherwise is we try to give them money. And as Vimo once said to me, which I thought was so profound, he said, Eric, there's not enough money in the world to solve the problem that I'm trying to solve here in India, but there are enough people. And so we want to just begin to notice what is, you know, what's that energy we're bringing to it. And chances are that, um, you know, that if you're in a forcing relationship to people, you're, you're not producing the change that you want. You're just creating more of the same problem. Um, I also want you to just reflect on, do you understand the other relationships to the problem that people have? Do you understand the authorities? Do you understand who are the casualties? Do you understand who the troublemakers are? Are you in relationship with them? Are you meeting with them? Are you having tea with them, as I've seen Vimal do many times in his movement? That's really important because you cannot lead consequential change 
with just one of these groups. If you just focus on the opposition or you just focus on the partners, it's really hard. So I just want to leave you with that thought again as you think about how you can begin to apply some of these concepts in your own work. So what I'd like to do right now is shift gears uh, to the um, to part two, a conversation with Bimal. And uh, just to set the table here, you know, what I'd like to do is look at another aspect, another key concept of adaptive leadership through the work and life of, of, of Bimal. I've learned so much about leadership from Bimal, more to be honest, than I've learned from experts at Harvard or from my work at you know, places like Google or the White House or pretty much anywhere else. So Vilma, I'm so grateful that you're able to join us from the road. Now, I understand that you're just wrapping up the filming of a documentary about India's so-called scavenger people. And, and for those of you who don't know, uh, the scavenger people in India are also known as Dalits or untouchables. Uh, so these are people that you know are really in, in, impoverished uh, who have experienced systemic oppression for over a thousand years. And Vimal is really doing nothing short of what I would call, you know, and I think it's accurate to call a civil rights movement for these folks. So, um, so Vimal, maybe you could just, um, you know, first of all, tell us why you've had a documentary filmmaker following you around the country uh, for the last month and a half or so. And, and tell us a little bit about what you're trying to achieve with uh, the scavenger community. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Harry. So, yeah, recently I just finished uh, my work with the filmmakers from the U.S. Uh, they came from the University of Central Florida. And uh, actually last year I, I got an opportunity to attend, attend a conference in the U.S. It's called Dirty Work. And I found this is a Google uh, conference going to be held in the U.S. Uh, it's called Dirty Work. And I just sent an email to them. Uh, I'm also working with the people those are engaged in dirty work, like you know, scavenging in India. And they said, uh, we don't have funds. We don't have any participants from different countries. We have participants only from the US. Uh, then I said, this is an international uh, conference. And how can how can you talk about dirty work without, without talking about our people in India? Those are engaged in manual scavenging. And then after some time, I received an email, and, uh, and they invited me as a guest speaker, the, not as a participant. So I visited the, the university as a guest speaker, and I delivered a talk there on Dirty Work uh, about manual scavenging. So I met many people there. And uh, in that series, I met Lisa. Lisa Mills is a professor in the University of Central Florida on filmmaking department. And she said, uh, I want to go to India, but uh, I don't know why. I don't know what, what, what I'm going to do in India, but I want to visit India. So can you please tell me about India or something? And I just explained about my work, what I am doing, what is the situation of Mandu scavengers, sweepers in India. And then she said, OK, uh, can we talk on Skype after that, after the conference? And I said, OK, then we talk about uh, six months Skype calls, emails, a lot of information I shared about the cost issues, and Bimble, issues can I, can in I, India. Bimbo, can I interrupt you for a second? Sorry. So, so just so we're following. So, yeah. so you met you met uh, this filmmaker while you were giving a a talk, and she and you invited her to come to India to really uh, see firsthand what's happening with the scavenger community and the work you're doing. Um, and you're in the process of that now. Can you, can you tell us just about the scavenger community and what is it you're trying to achieve with them? Yeah, so as you uh, as you can see the photo in the corner on the, on the, on the right, this is the gate of, of the hem, hamlet, my own house, is a scavenger community. So they are engaged in unclean occupations, like they, they are toilet cleaners, and most of them is uh, they clean the toilet without water in India. It's called dry latrines. And it, this this is illegal practice. Actually, they are not legally allowed to do that. And uh, so they are engaged in this illegal occupation. And due to their caste status and occupation, they are treated as the lowest caste in India. And due to this, they are also feeling untouchability in India. 
so recently you know uh, I, i should mention this thing right now i am in bhubaneswar and last week we had a cyclone a, a very big cyclone here in orissa and uh, last night i had seen a video about how even in the cyclone even in the cyclone people practice untouchability with the scavenger people they didn't allow uh, scavenger people into the shelter homes they spent all the night in the cyclone outside with the kids with the old ladies and uh, the persons those t- even you know i can i can i should say even cyclone can't can't stop this class practice in india in india so i'm working with these people and i'm happy i'm doing this so so i want dignity i want a dignity for a dignity for life for our people so and uh, that's why i'm working with education so i think education is the best way to get dignity to respect in this world hmm. Thank you, Vimal. So, uh, and, um, and your audio is breaking up a little bit, just so you know. So I'm just going to pause there um, just to see if we can get a better audio. But also, I want to just introduce another idea uh, from adaptive leadership, which I think I've really seen you do so brilliantly. And on the screen here, we have this question of what's the work? Uh, this is the second concept, or really the second question from adaptive leadership. And it really gets us into this question of what's the leadership work and how is that different from just doing our job really, really well? Um, there was a, a really great example, I thought, uh, of this notion uh, having to do with the library. So I'm gonna invite you in a minute to share a little bit about that. But before I do, uh, I wanna invite people on this call to take a look at this list. There's two lists here, list A and list B. Um, what do you think is different about these two columns, these two lists? What, what, what is different? What's, what strikes you as different about the work required to do the stuff in column A versus the stuff in column B? Let's just put that in the chat box. What, what comes to mind? Eric, can you share what's the, we ha- we're, a few words are covered up, um, the, oh, the final, the, yeah. The bottom, <laughs> it says, it's actually the same as column A. It says lose weight. Oh, there's nothing beside it. Okay. Yeah, so Clara said it's complicated and complex. Presumably, the ones on the right. Yeah. What else? What else is different between these two different columns here? A has more predictability than B. Yes. Very good. Uh, concrete versus conceptual. Yep. Complicated and complex challenges. These are all great. Yep. A is about the outcome. B is about the process. This is great. Empowering people. Behavioral change, you got it, you got it. Above the water, below the water. Perfect, guys, keep them coming, yeah. No instructions, sustainability and B, perfect. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So capacity building, so there's a, this is a great list. I think we should capture this list actually and, and, and write something about this. So um, B is relational, so yeah, that, that's it. So column A is what we call technical work. And technical work is really important. I mean, if you have a flat tire, you need to change it. If you need to create a plan or a budget, you got to create it. Um, well, probably none of us on this call have to build a submarine, but somebody does. And it's good to know that there's a you know best practice, a blueprint, experts you can call on to do that kind of work. And losing weight has some technical components as well. Column B, however, is a different, fundamentally different kind of work as you captured so well in this chat box. And column B is really about what we call adaptive work adaptive problems. And the the big difference between column A and column B or technical versus adaptive problems, hey, Araceli, good to see you on the call, is that um, with column A, with technical problems, there's a known problem, right? There's a known solution even. And it's not necessarily easy and it's still very important to do, but there's known problem and known solution. Versus column B, these adaptive problems are ones where we don't know what the solution is. It could be actually anything. It could be something that we, um, you know, that we need to figure out or something that changes depending on who you ask. So those, that's a signature of an adaptive problem. Uh, I put losing weight on both lists. Why, why do you think I have losing weight on both lists? Anyone? I think someone said it earlier on. Someone said that, yeah, column B tends to be more about involving other people. And if you've ever tried to lose weight or change your own lifestyle, you realize you can't do that without the support of friends or family, be it smoking or anything else, you know, smoking, losing weight, all those kind of health changes tend to be more adaptive. 
Um, this is a, uh, a picture uh, of a library, which Vimal, you recognize. Vimal, can you just tell us the, the, a kind of a, a very quick, technical, adaptive story about this library at your center? And this is, a, this, this, by the way, it's the second floor of that house that we saw in the previous picture that used to be Vimal's family home when he was little. So tell us what the, the technical, adaptive piece of this. I think it's really great. Yeah, actually, these photos are surprising me, you know, one by one. <laughs> and I'm happy to see these photos here. And so, uh, on the same rack, actually, first I would like to say the first rack here, that was our kitchen. The, my mother cooked uh, food there at the same place, and now it's a library, a small library, some books is there. Yeah, so an adaptive uh, leadership or technical, I'm, I, will, I would like to share one experience here. So one of my team member uh, is that uh, if you want to build a library, just buy books from the market and put it there and then work is done. And then you can say this is a library for the people. Uh, but I said it's not, it's not only about the books. So, so I want community people to buy these books so they can feel the ownership there. They can feel we bought these books. So we, uh, we bring this book from the market together on Saturday on January or with the date sometime. So it gives ownership, ownership to the community people uh, to buy these big books. If I book these books, then it's just a donation. Just put the books here, no one will come here. So I just try to give ownership to the people, to the community people, to allow them to buy books from the market and put it there. Thank you very much. I mean, it, it, guys, I, I just want you to really just notice this. I mean, it seems simple. It's so profound because one of the biggest waste of time and resources when leading consequential change is putting a technical fix on an adaptive challenge. We do it all the time. Yeah, it seems like it's easier. It seems more straightforward. It's something we know how to do, so it feels good. But if you listen to what Vimal is saying, and, and this is just one of many examples I've seen in his work, you know, what he, what he said, if I can paraphrase, is when the team member said, you know, Vimal, uh, we have these libraries for children, you know, as part of the movement to educate them, and yet we don't have enough books in them. Let's buy some books. And Vimal said, you know, buying books is the easy part. We know how to buy books. But when a community member from the scavenger community who might, makes maybe less than 3 or $4 per day manually scavenging dry toilets, right, with their hands, when they decide to spend what little money they have to purchase a book and put it in this library, now we know we're changing minds, we're changing values, they're valuing the education, they're taking an interest, they're believing in the community, believing in the, in the library. That's the adaptive work, guys. And it just, just imagine, had Vimo gone down the technical route, right? And said, okay, well, let's buy some books. What kind of rubric do we need to buy books? You know, what are, what are the different kind of books that we need? And then we can make a Excel spreadsheet, all the different kind of books and categories and topics. And maybe we can ask the community what they want. And again, it's a very typical way to think about project development. And maybe there's a time and place for that too. But in the case of you know, Vimo, where resources are limited and it's about people's hearts and minds, it's a very different way to frame the work, to get people focused on the leadership work needed. And so that was a small but profound leadership moment. And I want us all to be able to see in our own work. Think back to the project that I asked you to think about earlier on in this call. You know, what kind of technical approaches are you taking? You know, you're putting a fix on a problem. You know it's not going to fix it. It's not getting to the root causes. Maybe you tried it once and it came back again. You tried it again. You hired an expert, hired a consultant, and the problem keeps coming back. That's a signal that you're dealing with an adaptive problem. So let me say a little bit more. Thank you, Vimo, for that example. Um, so here's just a, a little graphic for those who are visual. So with technical problems, again, the problem and solution are clear. And the work then re resides with the authority figures, the experts, the bosses, right? With adaptive work, the problem is clear sometimes, but the solution is not. Or even sometimes the problem is unclear. You know, you ask people, what do you think the problem is here? And everyone has a different point of view. And in that case, the work is with the stakeholders, which is what the part that's covered on the screen says stakeholders. And that's, I think, Vimal, your example of involving the community, but also, you know, disappointing your own team members. And I'm sure maybe they got it over time, but at first people are like, what, what do you mean? And, you know, we've had some other conversations offline about how difficult those conversations could be because many of our teams are really stuck 
in technical work. That's where they feel confident. That's why they feel valued. And frankly, sometimes we do that too. So adaptive work really does require a much deeper shift in how we do our jobs, how we do our work, how we think about leadership. Um, you know, just another example, just to land the idea one more time here, is the idea of a broken arm. So you know, a broken arm is technical. We don't need to have a conversation about it. We don't need to involve stakeholders. We don't need to change minds and hearts. We just get it fixed by an expert, a doctor. But if I had, you know, say anxiety or some kind of heart problem that had to do with stress, that had to do with my eating habits, that would be more adaptive. So these technical and adaptive problems are everywhere in our lives, everywhere in our work. And this is just a language to begin to differentiate them so we don't waste time and resources putting a technical fix on a problem that fundamentally is not technical. Um, as I said, adaptive change, you know, the kind of change that happens when you do adaptive or adaptive work or is happens in your gut, it happens in your stomach, it happens in your heart, you know, it's below the neck uh, versus technical change or technical work, which happens in your intellect. And again, that forced based mentality that I talked about, the intellectual exertion, convincing people energy is not what we're talking about with leadership. We're talking about moving people in their hearts, right? In their, in their guts, their values, their loyalties, those kinds of things tend to be the hallmarks. So, uh, so just think about it. You know, why, why do we make this mistake? Why do we put adaptive or rather technical fixes on adaptive challenge? What's the pressure in your own life? And what would it take for you to have a conversation with a team member or a boss or somebody uh, who maybe is really caught up in a technical fix, but you know that's not gonna get you where you need to go? So let me just pause here for a couple minutes to see if there's any questions that are coming up from people. And I know there's questions flying through. So Danielle, if you wanna just tell us what's coming through on the line there, we have a few minutes just to you know, have any clarifying questions or maybe get another example from Vimo, whatever people tend might need on the call. So let me just turn yeah, to you yeah. guys. Yeah. Definitely, we do have some questions coming in. So um, Gil asked just in the last minute or so, does adaptive change always involve loss? Okay. What, give me, if you can give me two more questions, I could try to tackle them all in one. Okay, sounds good. Um, Christina is asking about getting started on the issue of economic opportunity and development. We decided to go the nonprofit route. How do you get grant support for the adaptive leadership approach uh, or work? Yeah. Um, and then we'll give you one more about aligning people. So uh, Jillian asked, how do you mobilize people who want to focus on different parts of the solution? How do you mobilize them forward towards an overarching solution, that type of? Mm -hmm. Great questions. So let me just take them. So Gil, yes, adaptive work, adaptive leadership always requires loss. Uh, and, and that's where systems change comes from because systems are actually built to resist loss. And so it's not just loss, you know, for loss's sake, but it's actually the values, the, the processes, the mindsets, the behaviors that are embedded in avoiding any kind of loss that we're trying to change. And we'll, we'll say more about that a little bit later on and have you reflect on loss for yourself potentially. Um, I can't remember who the next person was you mentioned, but the question of yeah, how do we get resources for this? You know, if you're a funder on this call, if you're a foundation executive or program officer or the head of a government ministry, uh, I really want you to think about, you know, dedicating at least 5% of your resources to adaptive work. Yes, most work will be technical, but I, I find that we tend to treat these deeper societal change challenges as purely technical. And so um, I really would advocate for you to do that. And there are ways, I'm happy to talk offline, I think it was Juliana, uh, with ways to do that. So feel free to reach out uh, on this question of how do we find resources for adaptive work. And then lastly, the question around you, know, how do we align stakeholders? You know, that's a, a much bigger conversation. I, I, the two ideas that I'm trying to lay out here very briefly are three ideas. One is to get on, uh, on the balcony. Do you know who the stakeholders are? Do you see the relationship to the issue, those different categories that I talked about? Um, do you see your own relationship to the problem? Are you actively engaging them, not all in the same room at the same time, but in different spaces to prepare them for the adaptive work? Are you having conversations about loss? So that, that's part of the work. And then the technical and adaptive piece, you know, when there's a technical solution put on the table, can you find it within yourself to say, you know, we tried that before, or if we do that, is that going to solve the whole thing? Or, um, gosh, you know, it feels like that's going to only solve part of the problem. You got to find your own language, unless people are on this call with you, where you can use the jargon of technical and adaptive to begin to shift people's attention to the adaptive work. Now, again, it's not all the time. Most work you do will be technical, but that small percentage is really what makes a difference. 
So that's, that's part of this. And then I think the last thing I want to talk to you about on this call is the idea of your own loss. You know, how do you prepare yourself to engage in adaptive work? Because frankly, most of the time I see the problem isn't out there. It's actually within yourself. And I think, Vimal, you spoke a bit about that as well. Um, but let me, let me invite you, Vimal, in, into that conversation since you talked about it. And, and this is maybe a bit more personal. Uh, in the, but I, you talked about the change to yourself. Can you just give us, you know, um, a little bit of an insight into the process that you've gone through in your own leadership to get to the place where you are today? Hello, Eric. Yes. <clears throat> Hello. Yes. Yeah, Eric, your voice is breaking. I can't hear you properly. Can you please repeat the sure. question? Yeah. Yeah. Just ask me to share. You talked earlier on in this call about the work you've had to do on yourself in order to more effectively exercise leadership. And I, if you could just you know, take a couple minutes, perhaps, and just share a little bit of the journey that you've been on in your own understanding of what it takes for you and the changes and the loss perhaps you have to go through to be more effective in your leadership. Yeah, I think that there's weak connection. Okay. So uh, your voice is, I can't hear you properly. So we'll, we'll pause that for now. Sorry, Bill. If you, if you get back on later on, let me know. Um, so I want to I shift here to um, this question. So how, how do we recognize when we're facing a leadership moment? Um, you know, what, what's the sign that you're in a moment that requires some adaptive leadership? And what I have here are what I call leadership moment flags, because it happens in a moment. It happens in a conversation. It happens you know, as you're preparing for a meeting or happens in a meeting, that's the leadership moment. And these are just, I think, 10 examples of times that if you notice them, you might say, okay, let me get on the balcony and find out, is there an adaptive piece of work to do here? What's the adaptive challenge? So the first one is that there's no known solution. And that's pretty easy to, like in the case of Vimmel's movement, there's no known solution to how you raise the profile and voice of 200,000 people in the Dalit community in India. So that's a pretty easy one to identify. Uh, second is people would rather avoid the issues. You know, they try to distract attention. The third is that you can't just logic your way into it. That's, that would be a technical problem. The fourth is that it's a recurring problem. It keeps coming back. The fifth is that it produces some kind of emotional response in you, not just an intellectual response. Uh, the sixth is that there are competing priorities. As a colleague of mine once said, you're being asked to choose between two things, not between what you want and what you don't want, but between what you want and what you really, 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 really want. That's a tougher choice. Uh, the la next one here is it feels risky. Casualties we talked about already. Uh, working across boundaries is another one. And then lastly, progress is not linear. It requires fits and starts and experimentation, which is why we call this a laboratory here. Um, so those are just some flags. And there's an article I think uh, that uh, Danielle can put in the link here that you can read that goes into this in a little bit more detail. And there'll be some resources we share at the end of this call to help you look at um, your own leadership choices. So Danielle, maybe you can put that link up there now for people if they want to click on that and read it after the after the call. Yes, will do. Yeah, hello, Eric. Yeah, hey, Vimal. Um, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. So okay. can I share my leadership, leadership moment? Yeah, please, please. Yeah, okay. Uh, actually, uh, after joining Acumen, Acumen, uh, fellowship in 2015, I was not aware about uh, what is leadership and how it will work. I never got any training or professional, you know, courses on the leadership before that. So I was, uh, I was with Eric in, in our leadership workshop in, in India during our recommend fellowship. And uh, I was sitting with uh, Eric and two more fellows there, Kadan and Deepak and Amit was there. And uh, they give me a feedback during a session uh, about my work and then i rejected you know i rejected that feedback i just protect myself my ego i i just try to share that show that i'm the best my work is the best i don't need any uh, feedback from the people they don't know about my community they don't know about my work so how can they give me a feedback so i just avoid i just you know ignore that feedback and uh, after that, just Eric gave me eye to eye contact and he said, uh, 
uh, thank you, my brother. Uh, best of luck for your work. But I am uh, really disappointed uh, by you. And uh, they just tried to wrap up uh, that session. And uh, immediately, I realized I, I am I did injustice. I am just uh, not fair about this, uh, you know, this feedback. And then I said, okay, Eric, can you please give me one more minute? And uh, they said, okay, you can take one more minute for that. So in that one minute, I shared everything, all the bad things about what I did in the moment. I just accept all the things, you know, those are not correct. I just accept the feedback from Eric. And immediate after that, after one minute, you know, I feel so relaxed. I feel like I feel, you know, so peace in my mind. And I said, oh, it was a burden on me. It was a burden on me since last five years. You know, I'm living with this burden of this fake cover as a leader of the community. But it was not right. So I feel so relaxed. And after the uh, after the workshop, I said to Eric, hey, Eric, I want to do with other people the same thing you have, you did to me because uh, I'm feeling so happy, I'm relaxed. So I want to make other people also relaxed and calm. So I was not aware about it. This is a leadership work or what. Well, I just wanted to make other people relax and calm, you know, to accept these things, to accept the feedback from the people and work properly. So actually that is the day when I started my leadership work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's such a powerful story. And, and it's, it's, I feel so humbled um, for you to, 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 to share that. Um, and you're doing such amazing work on behalf of this community and with this community. I, I had an opportunity to see Vimal recently, and I'll share more about that uh, by the end of this call, because it really just blew me away uh, what, what's happening here. So before I, um, before I do that, though, I just want to, uh, Danielle, if you could put, and there's some great questions in the comments, and I, I want to make sure people have the link uh, that, that, we, that we prepared so they can request more resources, you know, free workbooks, online courses, readings, uh, so they can go deeper on this. And we have some, also some stories, you know, that Vimal has shared in these articles as well. So there's just, it's, it's such a rich, rich set of experiences that Vimal's bringing to this call that we can't do justice to. But I want to just make sure we have that link out there so that um, people can really go deeper on their questions and on, on Vimal's story. Thank you again, Vimal. So Daniel, if you let us know when that link is, oh, there it is at the very top. Yeah, can you do the, um, the other one too, the uh, leadership info or leadership moment.info? Yes, yeah, I put that up as well, but I'll put it in the chat. Um, Thank you. Yeah, we have a few links for you guys, so here we Excellent. go. <laughs> so I want to I want to just change gears. Uh, we're going to move to the last part of this this call now, and I appreciate you all sticking with us. We're really, you know, we're going pretty deep here, and this is um this is going to be a video uh, from a movie called Invictus, and I just want it's about a three and a half minute video. I want you just to watch this and watch for the leadership moments. You may have seen this movie before. It's Morgan Freeman. He's telling the story of Nelson Mandela. And the scene that we're about to see is Nelson Mandela about to arrive at a sports committee meeting. Now, if you know anything about South African history, uh, the rugby team in South Africa during the time of, of apartheid, they were called the Springboks. These were the pride and joy of the Afrikaners, you know, the, the white people uh, in South Africa. And this committee, had just voted to get rid of the rugby, to get rid of the colors, to get rid of the sport. And, um, and Nelson Mandela, true story, you know, walks into this committee meeting. You'll see what he says. So I'm just going to play this so you can have a different experience of what I'm talking about and what Bimble's talking about when he says the leadership moment. And there's many that happen in this movie. So three and a half minutes, I'm going to invite you to, to watch it and really experience leadership in a, in a different way. So if we can uh, go to that video. What do I tell the Japanese trade delegation? I delegate that decision to you. You want me to inform the VP? No. We should at least include the Minister of Sport. No. I strongly advise against doing this, especially on your own. It gives the impression of autocratic leadership. You risk alienating your cabinet and your party. Your advice is duly noted. Madiba, the people want this. 
They hate the Springboks. They don't want to be represented by a team they cheered against all their lives. Yes, I know, but in this instance, the people are wrong. And as their elected leader, it is my job to show them that. You're risking your political capital. You're risking your future as our leader. The day I am afraid to do that is the day I am no longer fit to leave. At least risk it for something more important than rugby. Tell the boys I want to go to Ethers. Very fast. Brothers. Sisters. Comrades. I am here because I believe you have made a decision with insufficient information and foresight. I am aware of your earlier vote. I am aware that it was unanimous. Nonetheless, I believe we should restore the spring box. Restore their name, their emblem, and their colors immediately. Let me tell you why. On Robin Island, in Paul's Moore Prison, all of my jailers were Africanus. For 27 years, I studied them. I learned their language, read their books, their poetry. I had to know my enemy before I could prevail against them. And we did prevail, did we not? All of us here, we prevailed. Our enemy is no longer the Africana. They are our fellow South Africans, our partners in a democracy. And they treasure Springbok rugby. If we take that away, we lose them. We prove that we are what they feared we would be. We have to be better than that. We have to surprise them with the compassion, with restraint, and generosity. I know all of the things they deny us. But this is no time to celebrate petty revenge. This is the time to build our nation using every single brick available to us. Even if that brick comes wrapped in green and gold, Okay. Okay, are we back? Yes, I think so. Yes, I see Jason Adams. He said, identifying the hierarchy of needs for others. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you, Richard. Wow, it's amazing, isn't it? Any, anyone want to just chat, just chat some ideas you had as you were watching that movie about where the leadership moments were? By the way, I will say that once you start seeing the world through this kind of lens, thank you, Luis, me too. Um, challenging the status quo, right? Challenging his own people uh, is, is really at the heart of that. When you start seeing, you know, leadership in this way, it's hard to watch a movie without seeing it show up all the time. You know, I'll, I'll say to my wife, there's a leadership moment. <laughs> she says, shut up, Eric, let's watch a movie. But it's really amazing, right? And, and there's also a lot that we call leadership that's not leadership, in fact. So um, so I just want to yeah, encourage you again to, to really consider that uh, and be more choiceful about how you use the word leadership and think about leadership because oftentimes what we're talking about is not leadership but just people who are providing fake solutions technical solutions rather than challenging us challenging us to look at the technical solutions that we're putting on an adaptive problem and mandela so many examples now by the way in reality i think he got maybe 12 votes in his favor uh in in in, in the in the true story 
So you're not always successful when you lead, but that's a big part of it, is holding people's attention to the work, which he did quite well. Uh, and we wish we probably had more of now in South Africa as that country really slips into a different place. So the last part of this call, um, I want, and by the way, this is, a, this is a, a sculpture of Nelson Mandela that I saw in India in Delhi, which I'll say more about later on the call. Thanks, Jason, good comment. Uh, so last part of this, this, uh, this call is making your own adaptive change. Um, you know, the technical fixes from today are adaptive challenges from yesterday. You know, we, you, we can learn through adaptive work. We can actually make them technical. Uh, and it doesn't take long. We need to identify it first. So I want to invite you um, into a guided reflection for the last, you know, 10, 15 minutes of this call. And the way it's going to work is I'm going to actually ask you to reflect on uh, this idea of loss. But before I do that, let me just set this up. And I wish Vimo was on the call. I wish he could hear this part of the story, but he'll see the video afterward. So I, I was in in uh, in Delhi a few weeks ago with Vimo at a leadership workshop that he was running for leaders from the scavenger community around India. And at the very end of this workshop, Vimal said to the people who were there, he said, listen, I don't, uh, I don't ask for money uh, and, I, and I'm uncomfortable asking for money, but if, there, you know, if anyone here feels like they wanna to contribute to the cost of the workshop, and it was, you know, it was meager, but it was really um, expensive you know, when <laughs> there's no money. He said, you know, I'll, I'll take, I'll, you know, we'll take it for the hotel, for the food. Uh, you know, if you found some value in this, if you want to support the movement, of course, we'll take the money. But no compulsion, not mandatory, no expectation, no judgment. But if you want to contribute, we'll take it. And then Vimal said this. He said, and if anybody needs help getting home, because listen, let me tell you, the people that are in this workshop, many did not know where their next meal was going to come from. Many had no money. And they had traveled 38 hours, 45 hours by train, one way, to come to Delhi for a two-day workshop. And he said to them, if any of you need help getting home, the next meal, the train ride, let me know. We'll make sure you get home. We'll provide you that money. And what was beautiful about that moment to me was you know, here you had people giving money, but also receiving money. And it wasn't even about the money. It wasn't even about, I mean, in the end, he may have spent more money to pay for people to go home than he would have gotten for the workshop, but it wasn't about that. It was money being used to facilitate the exchange of these needs and gifts that people had to give to each other. And it was just a beautiful moment of giving the work back to people, of really having them take care of each other, of redefining the work, not about a workshop, but how we come together and support each other in this movement over a lifetime. Uh, so many of the principles of, a, of leadership that we talked about are exemplified in that story. And I saw many people literally give their last coin the last coin. And I, it made me think sitting there, you know, and I'm not someone who has experienced financial destitution in that way. I thought to myself, what is, what is something I care about so much in the way that they do that I'm willing to give my last coin? You know, and what is that last coin? So I want to remind you about loss and this idea that we need to give something up. This, came, this question came up earlier on in order to more fully realize our own leadership potential. And maybe it's about giving up seeking approval. Maybe it's giving up keeping everyone happy. Maybe it's giving up the pride of ben, having been right all along. Uh, maybe it's giving up a sense of being special. That's one that I struggle with. Maybe it's giving up financial security, letting go of grudge, a possession in your, that's wrapped up in your identity, your self-importance, a judgment you've been holding on to, a grudge. Uh, maybe it's giving up being seen as good or asserting dominance or deflecting intimacy, being in control. Maybe it's giving up being embarrassed or avoiding conflict. There's so many different forms of loss. And so I want, to, I want to just invite you for the last part of this call to reflect for one minute in silence. Now, one minute of silence on a call like this could be pretty deadly, uh, but I think it's really important that we take that time and honor the time that we've all spent together before we wrap up. So my invitation to you for the next minute is just to think about what are you ready to give up? Not what should you give up, not what do you need to give up? That's that old forced-based mentality that I talked about earlier on. But what are you ready to give up? So let me just give you some time to think about that, and then we'll wrap up with a short little wrap-up, and then we'll move on.
Okay. So a minute of silence with this many people on a call from all around the world, I think is so powerful. And it sends a powerful signal that, you know, in, in a way we're all in this together. And I, and I really deeply believe that. There are many people here who are doing work so different from what I do or from what Vimble does, but deep down we feel aligned, right? Deep down we know that the work we're doing is healing a community, healing a company, healing the world in some big or small way, it doesn't matter. So I really just cherish these moments of silence and would love if we were all in the room together. Maybe someday I can make that happen for us. But thank you, thank you for that. And Vimo, welcome back on. So um, we're gonna wrap up now. I just wanna just say, you know, so what what next? I mean, we I can't possibly tell you what you should do next. Um, you know, and I, and I wouldn't trust anybody who does. But if you're ready to lead, and some of you in the comments seem like you are, please take advantage of the resources that we're going to share um, at this link. I really, I really want you to avail yourself of some of the thinking that's gone into how do you lead consequential change. I also want you to think about, um, you know, how do you build others' capacity to lead? Because you, you can never lead alone. You know, if you're not sure, if you're not sure that you're ready to lead, if you're not sure this is the right time, that's fine. I just want you to repeat to yourself every day for the next six days, we're in this together, right? Reflect on that. We're in this together. Whenever you meet somebody and find and feel that truth, even if they don't know it themselves, reflect on this notion. We're in this together with people who are hard and people who are easy. And I think realizing this brings forward the inspiration to lead. We're in this together. And then lastly, for people who are unmoved by this conversation today, you know, that's okay too. I just want you to consider what form of control you're ready to let go of. And I've listed here on the screen some common forms of loss or, or control. And there's many, many others. So again, not what you should let go of, not what you want to, not what you need to, but what are you ready to? Because letting go, embracing that loss liberates energy. It really does. It makes you more effective because you have unconflicted behavior. And it's not an escape. Letting go is not at all an escape from messy dependencies. It's actually a step further into them. And Vimo, I think, can attest to that more than anybody else. It gets messier the more you get into it. It doesn't get easier. And letting go of that need to control it, to force it, this Newtonian force, I think is a big step into that freedom to lead more effectively, the freedom to release control. It's all about readiness. So I'd like to leave you with one last thought and then turn it back over to Danielle. And I want to go back to. Um, uh, actually, here's a great quote before I do. This is from the elder Lila well, uh, Lila Watson. If you come to help me, then you're wasting your time. If you come because your liberation is bound with mine, let us work together. That is so so powerful. So I just want to leave you with um, <laughs> this little sculpture. I saw this in India, as I mentioned, and it was um, it was on the grounds of the India International Center where I happened to be doing a workshop. It's Nelson Mandela. Uh, I think right after he was released from jail. And it occurred to me as I was looking at this sculpture that one of the only differences between us and Nelson Mandela is that he knew that he was in jail. We don't. So my invitation for you to, to discover your own capacity to lead change. And I hope this call, this conversation with Bimmo and his story has been a resource and inspiration and, and a, a source of hope for you all. And thank you again, Danielle, for the opportunity and Vimo for taking time amidst the hurricane and a month of crazy travel. I know you're back home with your family now, so thank you again. Is there anything else you want to share, Vimo, by way of goodbye before we turn it back to Danielle? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Eric. And so, you know, this is a cyclone affected area right now, so signals are very weak here, internet. So I would like to say about this, uh, uh, this a picture of Nelson Mandela. Uh, one of my known person in my city uh, asked my father, asked my father to provoke him. He said, "Hey, see what he's doing with your son Bimal. What he's doing? You know, he's bending here and there. See, all friends of Bimal are settled in the government jobs. They are. They have a lot of money, but people are still, you know, bending here and there. He don't have enough money. What he's doing? Uh, what he want to do in his life?" Then my, then my father simply smiled and said, you can't understand my son, uh, you, but you will understand later. So, you know, that makes me happy. The same thing I realized, uh, you know, my father, because I know why I'm still without less money, 
why I'm still uh, traveling a lot of, why I'm still, you know, spending time with my family, because only I know. And I'm happy my father and my family also know uh, why I'm like this. So it makes me happy and, it's, you know, this is in the same situation. I'm just trying to connect myself with this picture. And, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, my, my, my father-in-law, when someone asked him, what does Eric do? He said, I don't know. He just does, he does volunteer work, <laughs> which is great. I, I love that. I love it. So, uh, so thank you again, all, uh, Danielle, back over to you. Yes. Thank you so much, Eric and Bimmel for today and sharing all of those insights and stories. I think I really enjoyed how we heard both the, you know, um, specific uh, uh, concepts of adaptive leadership, but also the stories from each of you. So I really appreciate you guys taking the time to share that with everybody. Um, we do have the link for if you want to stay in touch with Eric and receive some more of these articles and insights and also a preview of um, a book that he's working on. So you can check that out. And I also just want to mention before we sign off that this was definitely a, a taster. And as you can see, it's a very um, uh, like a, a weighty concept that we tried to show some highlights in this online format, but there is a lot more to learn and a lot more to go into it. So uh, if you're interested to learn more, definitely check out Eric's link there. Um, and we also, yes, have these books and articles. So we'll share this resource as well. And of course, we have the Adaptive Leadership course with Plus Acumen that Eric so kindly helped us create and get online. So that's coming on July 9th, the next cohort. So you can register for that as well. And I'll put that link up. And yeah, so we invite to invite all of you to come and join that course as well. So thanks so much, you guys. Um, I think that's it for now, unless there's any final words, but that's pretty much what we had to cover. Okay, take care, everybody. Thanks for joining.